Well, it's good to uh, study with you again, and it's also good, and I would imagine that you share in this opinion, uh, that we're coming to the end of this series of uh, lessons. It uh, has been a little bit more uh, drawn out than intended when we started, but uh, have done the best that uh, we could do. I uh, would like to express appreciation to one more time to the Park Hill elders for the suggestion of the topics many, many years ago. Uh, and then also would like to express appreciation to the elders uh, of the Northside congregation here for providing me with one more opportunity, another opportunity to deal with this material, this series of lessons uh, here at Northside. It uh, has been my pleasure to present the material uh, any time that I have uh, had, had the uh, opportunity. So, uh, it's just about all over. We have talked about why churches are divided, in case you weren't in on discussion number one. We worked that over the uh, best I know how. Why are the churches of Christ divided? And so we discussed that at uh, some length. Then we discussed uh, where has division, where division has taken God's people. There have been certain attitudes <clears throat> that have developed in connection with the problems that prevail, that came about. And those attitudes continue with us even unto this day. And thus the second uh, topic, where has the vision taken uh, God's people? And I don't know, we had uh, several points under that heading. Then it is in connection with the third discussion that we kind of uh, uh, foul things up, at least in terms of the numbers uh, involved, how many discussions, because I got carried away with some part of the outline in chapter 3, broke it off uh, about halfway through because of the uh, time element and then finished it up uh, later, and uh, so made two discussions out of that, and that, that uh, involves the matter of respecting God's authority, and of course that's basic to all of this. It's, uh, it's basic to everything that we had to say, and uh, so I don't know, maybe it was appropriate that we break it in two, and... Uh, deal with the various things that we discussed. So that was three and then four. And then, <coughs> excuse me, the next uh, discussion was what are our limits of fellowship? And in that discussion uh, last time we talked about 1 John 1 in the main. We talked about uh, Romans 14 as I recall and then uh, finally we talked about 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 18, uh, and hope we made some sense out of the, uh, that particular discussion. Well, that leaves one other thing, and that is uh, what lies ahead for God's people or where, where are we headed as a result of all of this division, uh, as a result of the attitudes, all of the attitudes that have developed in connection with the problems and what have you, uh, what lies ahead for the people of God. Now, I have told you uh, right along, uh, two, two or three times, that I am not a prophet, and I, I am not the son of a prophet. And therefore, I approach this particular discussion with great care and I, I understand full well that about all I can do in this regard 
uh, is to look at trends, present uh, trends, uh, and then just kind of use my judgment about some things that I think lie ahead. Uh, I hope that the discussion will be helpful to you. And by the way, uh, uh, let me, I don't know if I mentioned this in the very beginning, but these topics were not my topics. Uh, whoever, whoever it was that initiated all of this assigned me topics. And they have been provided uh, by others. So if you want to know why I'm talking about this particular matter, it's because it was one of the assignments in the group. And so I tried to fulfill the job as it was assigned. The first thing that uh, <clears throat> I would emphasize under the heading of what lies ahead for the people of God is that the trend uh, away from the text will, in all probability, continue uh, in general. And that's because of human nature. When, when we get off track and when we head out uh, in areas where we ought not be, it becomes a very, very difficult thing to turn things around and to convince people generally that we're headed in the wrong direction. And so I, I believe I surmise that we're heading in the direction of the trend away from the text continuing. And that in just kind of a general way. People like to do what they want to do. And uh, when we head down that road, again, it's difficult to decide to do otherwise. And then besides that, there is that problem that enters into the picture that in Christ we are free men. And since we are free in Christ, then we are not fettered by a bunch of rules and regulations and what have you. And uh, as a matter of fact, the proposition that we are fettered by rules and regulations falls into the category of legalism. And we're not a part of that kind of system in Christ. We are free men in Christ. And so, that being the case, we can go ahead and do pretty much as we please to do. I would remind you, uh, and this is a, a, an entire sermon within and of itself, but I would remind you that that freedom business needs to be viewed very, very cautiously and very carefully as it is dealt with in the text. It is so that we are free in Christ, and that's emphasized in various places, but it is not so that we can conclude in connection with that, that as individuals, therefore, we can do what we very well please, and as churches, therefore, we can do what we very well please. I would remind you that the freedom uh, idea is that which looks uh, to the past. It does, doesn't really explain the present for us in terms of present duties and obligations and what have you, it just simply emphasizes something with a view to the past. Uh, and uh, to illustrate that for you, in John the 8th chapter, the Lord made the statement, uh, If you abide in my word, then are you truly my disciples, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. There is no doubt that he is talking about men being free, and there is no doubt that he's talking about the truth of God making men free, but if you will consider the context on down, I'm not going to read the whole section there, but if you read it on down, you understand that what he's saying is, you shall know the truth, the truth shall make you free from the past state of bondage to sin. 
And that's the emphasis of that. In what sense, in that context, are we free? Well, we are free from the past state. Uh, if we would accept the truth of uh, the Lord and be obedient to it, then we are free, be, be, become free from the past state of bondage to sin. Now that doesn't tell us all about the present, except how the present relates to that past state of bondage to sin. We're free from that. Now, does that mean that we're free in the sense uh, of the absolute? Or that we can very well do what we want to do as we choose to do it? It doesn't mean that at all. As a matter of fact, uh, if, you're, if we read it again real carefully, we deal with the present tense when the, the text says in verse 31, Jesus there, this in John 8 and verse 31, Jesus therefore said to those Jews that had believed him. Now, now listen, listen to it. Now we're talking about present tense matters and obligations. If ye abide in my word, then are ye truly my disciples. Present tense, if we would be his disciples, if we would be true to him, then what we have to do is abide in His Word. If ye abide in my Word, then are ye truly my disciples. And then He says, Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So, free from the past state, again, a bondage to sin, but as has to do with the present, we are under the obligation to abide, in His Word. So in a sense we're free and in, in a sense we're bound. We are free from that past condition, but we are bound presently with reference to His teachings and the obligations that He spells out for us. Uh, so it is, we can illustrate the, uh, the uh, same point in the book of Galatians. In Galatians 5, Paul said, For freedom did Christ set us free. So there's no doubt that there's freedom in Christ. For freedom did Christ set us free. Stand fast, therefore, and be not entangled again in a yoke of bondage. And if you're a good student of Galatians, you understand what the yoke of bondage is. That's the old law. Uh, the old order, it's referred to as a yoke of bondage. And in Christ, we are made free from that old order of things, the old mosaic system. And that's the idea of the freedom there. Sometimes folks stop a little uh, too quickly and just read, For freedom did Christ set us free. <laughs> <laughs> and therefore we're free and we can do what we want to. And that's all there is to it. And that's not all there is to it. We are free from a past state of bondage to the old order. Free from that. But with reference to the present uh, circumstance, he has more to say about that uh, later on in the same chapter in verse 13. He said, for ye brethren were called for freedom. And he just grants uh, that and, and says it is so. Ye were called for freedom. And we've already noticed that earlier in the chapter. But now notice what he says. Only use not your freedom for an occasion to the flesh, but through love... Uh, uh, through love be servants one of an, uh, of, uh, to another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, even this, thou shalt love thy neighbor uh, as thyself. But if ye bite and devour, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And then he describes what he means by the lust of the flesh. But uh, the statement that I'm after, other 
than the details provided there in that paragraph is again in verse 13. Only, he said, now your call for freedom, only use not your freedom for an occasion to the flesh. And that is to say, don't get carried away with this uh, new idea of freedom and decide that in connection with it, you're not under obligation to exercise self-control. As a matter of fact, we are. And that paragraph that begins in verse 16 and goes on down through there uh, clarifies uh, in very definite specifics with reference to uh, what's said in verse 13. And then, as a matter of fact, as you get on into chapter 6, the uh, thinking does not, uh, does not end. Verse 2 in chapter 6 says, Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Now, uh, granted, we are free. We are free from the old order, from the old mosaic system. But now we're under bondage. We're under bondage to Christ. We're under bondage to abide in His Word. We noticed in John 8. And here in Galatians 6 and verse 2, uh, we're under obligation to fulfill the law of Christ. And uh, so the concept of freedom always needs to be put in its proper context. We're free from the past state of bondage to sin. Therefore, we can do whatever we want to do? No, sir. If you abide in my word, then are you truly my disciples. In Galatians 5, we are free, no doubt about it. Ye brethren were called for freedom, verse 13. Does that mean that we can do anything in the world that we decide to do? Only use not your freedom for an occasion to the flesh, but through love be servants one to another. And again, looking to chapter 6 and verse 2, bear you one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. I can find you uh, five or six references that refer to the gospel as the law of Christ. So we are free, but we are bound. Another good reference in that regard is Romans, the sixth chapter. Uh, do not intend to spend a lot of time in Romans 6, but when we come to verse 17, uh, <clears throat> in Romans 6, Paul said, But thanks be to God that whereas you were servants of sin, and that's uh, slaves, bond servants is the idea, or slaves of sin, ye became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching whereunto you were delivered. That is to say, you obeyed the gospel. And verse 18 says, And being made free from sin, ye became servants, or again, slaves or bond servants, of righteousness. And so there, there it is, clearly stated. We are free in the context, but we are bound in the context. We are free from the past condition of being slaves to sin, being in bondage again to sin, but then becoming obedient from the heart to that form of teaching that was delivered to us, we were made free from that state, not in bondage to sin anymore, but now we're in bondage to something else. And the thing that we're in bondage to here is righteousness. He became servants of righteousness. So we left the one state of bondage and entered into another. So we're free uh, at, uh, uh, in connection with the first concept and bound by the other. We're sl free slaves. That's what we are. Christians or disciples of the Lord are free slaves. Free from the bondage of sin, we are slaves to that which is right. Well, the idea that we can do whatever we want to do as individuals or as congregations because we are free in Christ is erroneous and that kind of thinking needs to be restudied and that's stating it mildly. Point number two that I would like to talk to you about is that and things under the heading of uh, what lies ahead for the people of God, some are beginning to wake up 
and look around and demand Bible authority, and I'm a little bit inclined to think that more will follow. I think as we, we go farther and farther away from the divine standard uh, in application of the wisdom of man, then uh, you're going to have more and more looking up and around and saying, whoa, wait, wait, wait a minute here. Uh, what's going on? Why are, why are we doing some of these things? Or how are we doing some of these things? Or by what authority are we doing some of these things? And uh, the reason that I think that will happen uh, more and more as, as we go along is because I have seen some of it. And probably you have seen some of it. And that is uh, people just asking the question, what, what do you folks do here at this congregation and why do you do it? We had a a fellow one time come in, a state trooper, as a matter of fact, walked in the door and asked the question. He said, I'd like to know what you people do here, and I'd like to know why you do it. Uh, that attitude is the attitude that needs to prevail. And some are beginning to wake up, look around, and demand Bible authority, or look to the idea of Bible authority for that which is done. And I think that more, as time goes by, uh, will follow. I can, uh, I can give you a list of names just thinking about two or three congregations uh, where uh, people uh, have involved themselves in that very process and have taken a stand for the truth have said we, we've been doing a whole lot of things for which we have no biblical authority and I'm tired of that and I'm uh, walking away from it and there are various brethren that have done that and inclined to think that more will be of that mind as time goes by. And our, our obligation in connection with that is to watch, be vigilant and to watch for such attitudes. In any time you hear anybody express a notion such as that, I, I, I'm not sure about the things that we're doing. I don't, I don't understand why we're doing them. Uh, I don't see it in the Bible. I don't see Bible authority for this or that. Anytime you hear that kind of thing being discussed, you be careful to it and make certain that you use the occasion the very best that you can to try to help somebody see the truth and come to the truth. Well, point number three is this. Uh, what lies ahead for the people of God, if we're not careful, if we're not very, very careful, uh, it, it, the, then the matter of nitpicking, uh, my opinion, splitting and splintering, it will become the order of the day. And you see that a lot when you have issues that arise and uh, with reference to the conservative side of things. You see that kind of thing happen. And my opinion becomes more important than it needs to be. And then you have the nitpicking about every little bitty thing that amounts to nothing. And then you have, and you can have, that splitting and splintering of congregations when it ought not be there. Brethren, friends, and brethren, we do not need a congregation for every point of view. Now let, let me say that again. We do not need a congregation for every point of view, for every idea that I can come up with, or every opinion that you have about something. Uh, if we get to thinking otherwise, what's going to happen is we're going to wind up with a handful of people worshiping in our garage uh, or in our living room or some such thing as that. And then if the uh, stubborn attitudes such as that persist, uh, we're going to wind up uh, worshiping in another room in the house with just uh, me and my wife. And that sort of thing uh, can be difficult 
uh, indeed as it continues along. Uh, now, you, you want some surmising uh, on my part? There, there's some of it. What lies ahead for the people of God? We need to be careful and cautious about this sort of thing to make certain that we don't split and splinter uh, over every little old ripple in the pond. Well, point number four, need to speed up a little uh, here. What lies ahead for us more and more, I believe, outsiders uh, will become interested uh, in the gospel as the unsatisfactory nature of goods and gadgets dawn upon us. Uh, I think that lies ahead because the abundance of our blessings and our good land today, uh, that abundance is, uh, staggers the mind. It reminds us of Ecclesiastes 2 where Solomon listed all of the good things that he had and all the good things that he had done and all the good things that he had worked and that he possessed. And you remember that list. And uh, uh, as you read it, uh, the list, it staggers the mind. And you would think, you would think that as he gives us the list and then gets to the end of it, he would say, uh, okay, now let me tell you how I feel about all of this. The way I feel is that I am one happy fellow because I have all of these goods and gadgets and money and property and, and what, what have you because all of this stuff is mine. And I'm the happiest fellow on the face of the earth. Uh, how could you possibly be otherwise? But that's, that's not what he said. He said, now, now, let, let me tell you how I feel about all of this. There is no profit under the sun. He said, I, I uh, look at it all, uh, and it, it's all uh, striving after wind. Uh, and it's, uh, there's, there's no profit. I don't see any profit in it with reference to life under the sun. And I submit to you that uh, that's a process that continues. Every now and then, a person will come to that same state of mind that I've worked hard and I've piled this up and piled that up and I've so much money in the bank and all of that and I ought to be as happy as I can be, but I'm not as happy as I can be. What's going on here? Well, there's something that is missing that needs to be there, and that is that there is something more important uh, in the world than goods and gadgets and what hap have you. Uh, and as our prosperity uh, continues along the way and as we evaluate it, I think one of the things that lies ahead for the people of God is more and more the disposition on the part of people will be uh, that thinking that we have just described and thus will become more and more ready candidates for the gospel of Christ. Another thing that I think lies ahead is the full realization that numbers and statistics uh, mean little uh, or nothing at all. Uh, sometimes I think we get to thinking that if we can get the numbers high enough and the statistics way on out the ceiling and all, then, the, then we've handled the most important thing. But that's not the, the most important thing. I call it the get them in craze. The get, the get them in craze is a bunch of nonsense. What we need to be emphasizing is the matter of the gospel of Christ and presenting it in truth. And those that love the truth will appreciate it, will take hold of it, run with it, and be saved by the same. But to get them in craze uh, is crazy. It's nonsense. And by the way, in that regard, we need to stop this stuff about feeding them hot dogs and, and uh Cokes and coffee and, and what have you, uh, and just start passing money out at the door. I have advocated that for years. Stop, stop all this other stuff, the, the building of the fancy gymnasium, uh, the feeding of the 
uh, on this occasion in that, the passing out of food when somebody gets hungry. What we need to do is pass money out at the door. Now, we can advertise that every Sunday morning, uh, and you, you need to get into that uh, after our services. You have to attend the services. And then at the end of services, then we're going to pass out uh, a significant amount of cash to each one who has been present. And I submit unto you that that's the best appeal that can be made in that kind of category. Forget the hot dogs, for pity's sake. Get the money out and pass the money out at the door and it'll work. And you'll fill that building up so fast it'll make your head spin. But I'm telling you that the get them in craze uh, is nonsense. It uh, nowhere is that kind of sentiment stated in the text. In John 6, as a matter of fact, uh, it is uh, condemned in the text. Uh, the Lord telling the folks that were following him because they were hungry that they weren't following, following him because they saw the signs and understood them and appreciated him because of it. They were following him around because they were hungry. He fed them yesterday and they want to be fed again today. And that's the way that works, by the way. Well, and, by, and in connection with that, for whatever it's worth to you, let me emphasize this, that you cannot start a congregation just anywhere and expect it to flourish like crazy. Now let, let, let me say that again. You cannot start a congregation just anywhere and then expect that congregation to just grow by leaps and bounds ongoingly. You can't do that. Th things just do not work that way. And that's because of the way people are in this area and that. I remember in Acts 18 and verse 10, the Lord telling Paul, I want you to stay for a while in the city of Corinth. Now, why was that? He didn't tell him that everywhere he went, but he told him that there. I want you to stay put for a while. Why was that? Because I have many people in this place. What do you mean by that? I have many people in this place. He had many there that were going to listen to the truth. They were inclined to the truth. And when they heard it, they were going to accept it. And they were going to be saved by it. And there were a whole bunch of people there that had that attitude. And the Lord knew that. And so he told Paul, I want you to stay put. You stay here for a while. Because I have many people in this place. Now he didn't tell him that everywhere he went because he didn't have that everywhere he went. It, it is not so that in every single place where Paul preached, he enjoyed the success that he did at Corinth. And we need to understand that you cannot start a church just anywhere and expect it to flourish. Now, if there are enough people in that area or out, out and around that love the truth, and that are the people of God in the sense that they have a love for the truth, then you have something that will grow and grow. If they're not out there, then you have something that is otherwise. But anyway, where are we headed? To a full realization that numbers and the statistics and what have you mean little or nothing at all. That's not the main thing. The main thing is the truth of God being faithfully presented by those who love it and are inclined to have it can be saved by it. Well, just about through. Point number six, I believe it is, in the outline, what lies ahead, renewed interest in preaching the basics. Brother Hales, Todd Hales, and I talk about this from time to time. Uh, we need to keep the basics in mind. I know that we're to go beyond that, but that, that doesn't mean that we, we are to forget that. We're not to forget uh, just uh, the idea of, foundational things and uh, what I mean by that is that I think there's going to be a re renewed interest in the, preaching the plan of salvation how long how long has it been uh, since you've heard a, a sermon a gospel sermon in a gospel meeting 
on the subject of what must I do to be saved. I think there will be, eventually, a renewed interest in preaching the plan of what we refer to as the plan of salvation. And I don't hesitate to use that expression. If somebody doesn't like that expression, I guess they can use another one. But I like that one. That's what it is. It is a plan. It's God's plan whereby men might be saved. And there's nothing wrong with referring to it as the plan of salvation. And I don't know how you refer to it or de deal with it adequately uh, other than referring to the particular parts of it. I don't know how you do that either. Sooner or later, you have to get around to the particular. There's going to be a, a, perhaps a renewed interest in, in preaching in, on the subject of worship in spirit and in truth, John 4, 24. That God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And perhaps you will remember our discussion earlier in the series on John 4, 24. I think there will be a renewed interest in, eventually in the work of the church. What's the church all about? Why has it been originated? What's the proper functioning of it? Those things are spelled out in Scripture, and they have to do with God's assignment. And we need to be preaching on it time and time again. And I think there will be a renewed interest in the organization of the church. That ought to be hit time and again. We ought to preach on it repeatedly because the organization of the church is also God's assignment. And it has been assigned for a very definite cause. Well, one last thing I will emphasize, and that is I think in terms of what lies ahead, the, the, the thing... One of those things is a, a certain boldness, and I do not mean haughtiness. I'm not saying haughtiness or anything that is akin to that. But a certain boldness that comes from standing with God and His inspired message. When you can cite that, thus saith the Lord for what you advocate and for what you practice and for where you stand. And when you can stand uh, in connection with the teaching, practice in connection with the teaching, there is a certain and definite boldness that attaches to that. Get your concordance out and see how many times uh, the inspired men did their work with a bold attitude as, as they went about the work. I think we will see a certain boldness that comes from standing with God and His inspired message as things continue along. Can we know it, by the way? Some, some say we can't. Can we know uh, the inspired message? Can we know the will of the Father? Well, why, why in the world do we think it's been recorded? Why has it been written down? Why has it been given to us? Why... Did Paul say in Ephesians 5 and verse 17, Be not ignorant, but understand what the will of the Lord is. If we can't understand it, why are we told to do so? It doesn't make much sense to tell us to do something that we can't do. Be not foolish. Don't be foolish. Don't live your life foolishly. But understand what the will of the Lord is. Can we understand it? I believe that we can. Now, we may not want, uh, be of the mind to do what we have to do to understand it, but uh, we're required to understand it, and therefore we can. And again, there's a certain boldness that attaches to such a process and attitude as that. Well, uh, I'm through. Those five, actually six, as it turned out, Discussions having to do with the church, division, the authority of God, and related matters. I thank the Park Hill elders again for bringing it all about. I thank the Northside elders for the opportunity once again to discuss of these things. I hope that I have presented the material in such a way that it will do the good intended. Let us pray, and we will be through. Our God and our Father in heaven, we give thanks unto thee for another occasion for worship and for study. 
We're thankful for thy word to guide us along the way and pray fervently that it will do just exactly that, that we will see to it. We give uh, thanks for the various congregations that propagate the truth of the gospel and pray that they will continue in faithfulness along the way. Bless us all as we strive to do the things that are good and right to help us to live our lives in such a way that ultimately we will live in the house of the Lord forever. In the name of Christ we ask it. And amen.